Fuel economy was the name of the game in the late 1970s as the automakers started downsizing their vehicle fleet, not only to become more efficient in response to the 1973 OPEC oil embargo and customer fears related to that, but also because there was now knowledge that there were going to be impending corporate average fuel economy standards that would mandate that automakers had to achieve a fleet average of 27.5 miles per gallon by the mid to late 1980s. In other words, when you took an average of the highway fuel economy that cars could achieve across the portfolio of vehicles sold by any automaker, the overall average had to be greater than 27.5 miles per gallon, otherwise the automaker would be penalized. Now, in pursuit of achieving the higher fuel economy standards, cars started to downsize, and the first round of downsizing really began in 1977 when General Motors downsized their full-size lineup, the Caprice, the Catalina, Bonneville, Olds 88, 98, Buick LeSabre, Electra, and the Cadillac DeVille and Fleetwood, and would continue for General Motors in 1978 when they would downsize their intermediate cars like the Cutlass, the Regal, the Grand Prix, And Ford would end up following suit in 1979 with the new Panther platform cars. Chrysler would also introduce a new line of downsized vehicles, the R-bodies, around this time too. So there was a lot going on in the auto industry during this time frame. Some of the developments were positive. Actually, customers ended up liking General Motors' downsized cars that came out for 1977, and I would say Ford's Panther platform was a success as well. The R-body Chrysler as well, not so much. But the K-cars that Chrysler would eventually bring out certainly helped them. But as downsizing became the norm, engines were getting smaller and smaller. For instance, after 1976, General Motors would sunset all of its 455 cubic inch V8s from Pontiac, Oldsmobile, as well as Buick, in addition to the Cadillac 500 cubic inch V8 that was still charging around in 1976. Chevrolet would keep their 454, but it would be gone from passenger cars after this. And in the place of these big block engines were a series of different V8s. Buick 350 became one of the top engines, as well as the Olds 403 cubic inch small block V8, and yes, the 403 was a small block. It was based on the smaller deck 350 cubic inch V8 as opposed to the larger 455 cubic inch V8. But I digress. The Olds 403, the Buick 350, and the Pontiac 301 became, well, let's say more commonplace during this time frame. The 301 was just introduced at this time. And the 403 was as well as kind of downsized engines that were used across all of General Motors' fleet. And as time would go on, more downsizing of the engines would continue to the point that Oldsmobile ended up producing a 260 cubic inch V8. And Pontiac, as I've already mentioned, produced their 301, but also produced a 265 cubic inch V8. So these V8s were very small, kind of around only for a brief time period, around that 1980-81 mark. And during this time frame, GM also began developing some interesting carburetors, and that is the subject of this particular video. Now, four-barrel carburetors had been around for some time. Two-barrel carburetors had also been around, and General Motors produced some great carburetors. On the four-barrel side, ever since the 1966 model year, GM had offered the Quadrajet in some vehicles, And it really was an excellent carburetor in general, although a little bit more complicated, let's say, than a Holley or a Carter AFB. The Quadrajet, with its very small primaries and supersized secondaries, was between 750 and 800 CFM in terms of how much air it could flow. And it delivered great fuel economy and great performance, owing to those very small primaries and supersized secondaries. It was Not a square bore carburetor, but it was a spread bore carburetor would be the correct term for this. Now, at the time, many carburetors were square bore, meaning the primaries and the secondaries were the same size, 
or the secondaries were just slightly larger. But obviously the quadrant, as you can see here, took that to the extreme and it worked very well. Now, in 1977, though, General Motors introduced a new two-barrel carburetor. And again, you think, well, this doesn't really mean all that much. Two-barrel carburetors are pretty commonplace. The Rochester 2GC, for instance, was an excellent two-barrel carburetor that had been used for many years prior to 1977. But for whatever reason, GM decided to introduce a new two-barrel carburetor around this time frame, and that was the dual-jet carburetor. Now, before I get into the details of this early dual jet, I'm going to call it an early dual jet, because some of you may have seen the more commonplace dual jet that was effectively half of a Rochester quadrajet. And it looks pretty funny here. It's basically the primaries of the quadrajet. And that has, uh, let's say, good elements and bad elements. The good elements, relative reliability and simplicity, ease for General Motors to manufacture this. But on the downside, I mentioned the Quadrajet had kind of ultra small primaries and very large secondaries. So you couldn't put this dual jet on any good sized engine without just constricting the airflow to it because it really wasn't made to be a standalone two barrel carburetor originally like the Rochester 2GC was. It was almost like trying to run a marathon while sucking through a straw. That's kind of the best analogy that I could have associated with this dual jet. And while this dual jet, the later one, is funky, the subject of this video is going to be the early dual jet because, well, take a look here. Now, at first glance, does this look like a two-barrel dual jet that I just showed to you, or does it look like a quadrajet? It looks almost identical to a quadrajet. It looks like you've got a place for those big secondaries, and you have uh, the primary Venturi as well. But upon closer examination, take a look at this picture, you'll notice that there are no secondaries. It's just a complete casting. The casting is the same size as the Quadrajet, but there are no secondary air valves and there's no secondary metering rods. There is no secondary circuit to this carburetor. It just looks like a Quadrajet. And you know this was the early dual jet that General Motors introduced before they went to that other version that I showed previously. And I think it's absolutely humorous. So don't get fooled when you're looking and popping the air cleaner off to take a look at the carburetor on a car that you're looking at buying and thinking that this is a quadrajet, and it's really just a early dual jet. Now, what's even more hilarious about this is that if you take a look at this, this is an Olds 260 cubic inch V8 with the dual jet removed. <laughs> it's hilarious. Take a look. You can see the primaries and how they feed the intake, but then because the carburetor mounts in four different points, the intake has to have a mounting spot for those four different points on it. And there's no secondary circuit here, no holes for the secondaries, but there is a platform upon which the carburetor can sit. Again, it just looks absolutely hilarious when you see this intake and you see the primary circuit and you're missing the secondary circuit. Uh, and the gasket, as you can see here, has, well, just similar to what you saw, has really the principal... Uh, purpose for the gasket here is to seal the primary circuit because there is no secondary circuit. So I don't know of another carburetor that was created that was effectively a different carburetor, like a quadrajet, and it just removed some circuits out of it but kept the casting basically the same. Now, for whatever reason, after a few years, GM went to that smaller version of the dual jet that was literally just the primaries and it had the, the remaining secondaries removed. It just didn't exist in that version of the dual jet. I don't know what prompted that, but it looks more normal, still abnormal compared to a Rochester 2GC. But, oh well, you know, they elected to change. So I thought I would at least highlight this early dual jet carburetor that you could find, as I mentioned, on Pontiac, 301, some Olds 260 V8s, Pontiac 265s, and I just thought it was especially humorous to see under hood what you would think is a quadrajet, but upon closer examination, well, it's actually just a little visual trickery, and all you got was a puny little two-barrel carburetor to feed your relatively weak engine. Incidentally, the Pontiac 301, talking about weak,
would be one of the few VAs where the crankshaft only has two counterweights on it. It's a very lightweight crankshaft. GM was doing a number of things to the V8 engines during this time frame to not only downsize them, but to save weight. And the two, let's say, counterweight crankshaft of the 301 was one example. The hollow main bearing webs on the Olds 403 V8 was another example. And as a consequence, some of these little engines, you also want to make sure you don't rev them over about 4,000 RPM or you're really just asking for trouble. They'll last a long time if you keep the RPMs down. But if you really start revving them, I just would not recommend that. And you don't get any more power anyway because you're sucking the air through that straw, so to speak, with your old school Rochester dual jet. Thanks again for watching. What do you think about the Rochester dual jet? Pretty sweet carburetor. Put a comment in the comment section. Thanks again for watching.